Welcome back. At the conclusion of session two, the learner should be able to, one, discuss the six steps of curriculum development in healthcare education as proposed by Kern and colleagues. Two, describe key concepts that should be considered when developing curriculum that includes simulation. Curriculum is a planned educational experience, the development of which therefore requires a logical and systematic approach. Those of us in healthcare education have a professional obligation to meet the learning needs of our students who will ultimately care for patients and communities. In addition, accreditation standards and regulatory guidelines often require documentation of clearly articulated learning outcomes, teaching methods, and assessment and evaluation plans. Kern, Thomas, and Hughes' Curriculum Development for Medical Education, a six-step approach, now in its third edition, provides one framework for curriculum development in healthcare, edu healthcare education. The framework is simple, easy to use, applies to multiple healthcare disciplines, and is particularly useful when experiential learning methods like simulation are integrated in the curriculum. Let's take a closer look at each of the six steps proposed by Kern and colleagues. The first step in this approach is problem identification and a general needs assessment. The second step is a targeted needs assessment. The third step involves formulating goals and objectives. Step four speaks to selection of educational strategies. Actual implementation of the curriculum or curricular change is addressed in step five. And evaluation and feedback is in the sixth and final step. It should be noted that the process is intended to be cyclic and ongoing with assessment and, evalu and evaluation data continually informing curricular improvement. We're gonna start with step one with an assessment of the current healthcare need a determination of how that need is currently being addressed and how it might best be addressed. Who in the healthcare system is being affected? What is being affected? And to what degree? For example, this assessment may reveal that elderly patients have a need that is severely affecting quality of life. Step one is where the problem is really at. Moving on to step two. This step also involves a needs assessment but this assessment is specific to the learning needs of those in your course, program, or institution. This needs assessment includes an assessment of available resources and occurs at two levels. The first level is targeted at learners with assessment of current and past experiences, strengths and weaknesses, knowledge deficits, attitudes, skills, and performance. The second level is targeted at the learning environment with assessment of the current curriculum, characteristics of the environment that facilitate learning, and the needs of key stakeholders. Once the needs of the learners have been determined, the next step would be to modify the curriculum to meet those needs by setting goals and objectives. According to Kern and colleagues, goals are broader educational objectives relative to competency in particular area, while objectives are specific and measurable. Goals relay the overall purpose of the curriculum while objectives inform the methodology and assessment evaluation methods. As discussed in session one, objectives should be written relative to the cognitive, affective, and psychomotor domains of learning. And so, steps one through three, general needs assessment, targeted needs assessment, and establishment of goals and objectives will determine if simulation is the best educational strategy or methodology to meet the objectives and ultimately the needs of the learners. Educational strategy, including the content and teaching method, is the pathway to the achievement of student learning outcomes. Appropriately designed simulation may be used to achieve cognitive, affective, and psychomotor objectives. Kirkpatrick's levels of learner evaluation, discussed in session one, provides a framework for evaluation that's often used in simulation. Moving on to step five, implementation, We'll go ahead and assume that it's been determined that simulation is an appropriate educational strategy to meet the objectives that were established after general and targeted needs assessments. During the implementation phase, the resources necessary to plan and execute the curricular change, in this case simulation, are secured and any barriers to change must be navigated. The simulation activity is executed in a plan for assessment evaluation of the simulation the learners and the facilitators is in place. Simulation may not be widely accepted as a teaching strategy where you are. The success of this curricular change 
is partly determined by your ability to effectively garner the political support necessary to plan and execute high quality simulation. Step six may seem like the final step, but as I mentioned earlier, this is a cyclic process with assessment evaluation feeding ongoing curricular vision and improvement. Feedback is a judgment of individual performance relative to stated objectives. It should be noted that feedback is different than debrief that's addressed in the International Nursing Association Clinical Simulation and Learning Standards for Best Practice for Simulation. Debrief is a group activity that occurs at the end of a simulation activity with an aim of learning through reflective analysis. Feedback is generally given to learners individually as performance is evaluated, evaluated relative to measurable objectives. Step six is driven by clarification of the users of the evaluation. The users may, for example, be the learners, faculty, or simulation facilitators. The use of the evaluation must be clarified as well. Will you be evaluating individual learners or an entire program? Is the evaluation intended to be formative for the sake of learning and feedback, or summative for a grade or end of program assessment? An evaluation of resources is essential and should be considered early in the planning process to ensure adequate funding for curricular change. The evaluation questions must align with the objectives and the evaluation design. The evaluation design itself must be feasible in terms of available resources. Measurement instruments and methods must be congruent with the evaluation questions and the objectives. The evaluation process should also address any threats to privacy, confidentiality, or human rights. And lastly, plans for data collection and timely reporting should be in place at the time of the curricular intervention, in this case, the simulation. A few words on measurement tools and the validity of the data being collected. There are now many valid and reliable measurement tools used in simulation-based learning. However, it's not uncommon for an array of checklists and surveys to be used to evaluate student performance in simulation. Regardless of the tool used, there are threats to validity necessitating multiple measures to, inf to inform an assessment and evaluation. In short, content validity refers to how well the tool measures the behavior for which it was intended. Do all items belong on the tool? Does it provide a comprehensive measurement? Construct validity is the degree to which the action taken by the learner represents the construct or phenomenon of interest. And reliability is found in consistency and reproducibility of the tool. Now that we've reviewed the six steps of curricular design and talked a bit about measurement tools, I'd like to shift to a few key concepts to consider should you follow steps one through three and determine that simulation is the best educational strategy. The first concept to consider is feasibility. A simulation is feasible when the essential components of the simulation can be easily recognized and replicated in an actual clinical situation, such that the learners might apply the concepts in clinical practice. The second is fidelity. Fidelity is the degree of realism, but a high degree of fidelity is not always associated with enhanced student learning. The degree of fidelity must, however, be high enough for learners to meet learning outcomes and sufficient for learners to be willing to suspend disbelief. The learner's abilities to suspend disbelief does, however, positively impact the learning experience as the participant is able to accept the unrealistic aspects of the simulation for the sake of learning. It's now time for you to complete the knowledge check for this session, as well as the discussion board and summative evaluation.